Um, wanted to uh, welcome you all. Thank you very, very much for being here. I think we still have some more people coming in, but that's okay. We'll go ahead and get started to respect everyone's time. Um, we have such a great topic tonight and an amazing presenter. So I'm very excited that you're with us. Uh, my name is Kim Porter. I'm the executive director of Be a Part of the Conversation. Our program tonight is called 21st Century Teens. Um, we know that you're joining from all over the region and we're really, really grateful that you're with us. Uh, yet we are hosted by uh, the Hatboro Horsham School District and this program is funded by the Hatboro Horsham Educational Foundation. So we're very grateful to these partners, particularly because this is actually where we were founded um, in 2011. We've been doing community events since 2011 and it all started as a school district initiative in Hatboro Horsham. So eternally grateful for that, but very much welcome to all. We're in a five county region these days and uh, work with a lot of communities and our programs range from prevention, like tonight is a bit of a prevention, early intervention uh, topic, but then we move into a lot more to do with substance use, uh, pathways to recovery from substance use disorders, family support. I'm a family member. I have um, a, an adult son who today has 14 years in recovery. So this is actually his soberversary. So I'm very proud of my son and I'm, and I'm grateful that he uh, supports the work that I do to work with other families who have found themselves in the same place that we were all those years ago. Uh, and he was a upper abortion kid. And so, um, yes, yeah, so we are recording this program, but I want to assure you that when we get to the Q&A, if you want to ask a question, you can do it more privately by putting it in the chat, but you're also welcome to raise your hand We'll call on you. Um, you can unmute and ask your question. At that point, um, we'll keep recording, but I will edit that out. It will not go on to the YouTube channel. Um, this, this recording will be on the YouTube channel, but not your personal comments and questions that come up. So I want to assure you about that, that we will um, respect everyone's privacy there. Uh, we have a survey that shows up at the end of the program. So please, please, please take a moment to complete that. We don't get a lot of response on the survey. I think people are like, okay, it's over. I can walk away from my computer. But if you can just take a moment to complete that survey, I would be very grateful. We would be very grateful. It helps us so much to, to get that feedback. It helps us with funding these kinds of programs and so on. I'll try to remember to put that link to the survey monkey in the chat at the end of the program as well, but it should come up on your screen also. You can follow up on tonight's program on our website. Our website is conversation.zone and slash parents is the, the landing page for where this recording will be and a lot of other uh, information that supports the topic. And I'm going to put all these links in the chat when I stop talking in just a minute here. You can find other upcoming programs that we have on our calendar, which is conversation.zone slash calendar. And we have about 140 programs recorded on our YouTube channel. You know, COVID pushed us into the Zoom world uh, four year, almost four years ago now, just about four years ago, wasn't it? Um, and uh, that did afford us the opportunity to record a lot of our programs like we are tonight. And so about half of our programs today are in person, but um, those recorded programs are right there on our YouTube channel. So I encourage you to check that out as well. I'd like to let you know that as I mentioned, there are parents like me who have been impacted by our child's substance use. And we, I really needed these meetings. Um, these are support groups that are peer led, similar to Al-Anon or Naranon, but they are not 12 step programs, although we encourage those as well. Uh, we have crosstalk, we help each other out tremendously. We currently have 21 meetings taking place every week. About half of them are on Zoom, about half take place in person. And click on any of these buttons and get the details about the meeting, whether it's the address or the Zoom link or an email to check in with someone to ask a question, but you don't have to register, just show up and you're always welcome. We also have a family recovery course. This is a three-part course. To All of this is free to attend, by the way, never a charge to attend any of our programs. Um, that's, this course is for parents who have identified that their child has a substance use disorder prevention program, but truly to help parents, guardians, and grandparents understand how the child has been impacted by substance use, but more importantly, how we as family members can recover. And so now I'm really grateful to introduce you to our um, speaker tonight. He is not only a 
greatly admired and respected clinician in our region. He happens to be the clinical advisor for our organization, be a part of the conversation. Uh, Michael Blanche is the co-founder of Ethos Treatment, and he is a licensed clinical social worker with more than 20 years of experience providing direct clinical treatment for those who are dually diagnosed with addiction and other psychological issues. He's worked in all levels of care and the treatment of addiction and mental health with extensive expertise in establishing and supervising residential and outpatient programs throughout the Philadelphia region. Michael is a leading expert in the field of prevention, specializing in middle and high school prevention talks and staff development. He provides CEUs on the impact of technology, process addictions, complex trauma, young adult substance use, and dual diagnosis as just a few of the workshops that he has facilitated. He's known for working with complex individuals and their families, assisting in difficult times of discerning the appropriate level of care or proper placement. So Mike, the floor is yours. So glad that you're here and glad you're all here. Thanks. Thanks, Kim. <laughs> and first off, thank you to Don and <clears throat> Hatboro Horsham School District and uh, uh, their kind of uh, initiating the support to be a part of the conversation uh, and longtime support to be a part of the conversation. And as Kim said, uh, my name is Mike Blanche. I'm a, I'm a therapist by trade. And um, uh, just to, to get this up front right away, um, I've been presenting and, and providing uh, clinical updates for folks that struggle with substance use disorder and, and mental health. And a majority of my career, I've been working with adolescents. Uh, translation, a majority of my career, I'm used to being interrupted constantly. So if you have any questions uh, or, or, or want to say something, uh, be part of the conversation, always tries to promote more of a conversational style. I have statistics. I have a PowerPoint. I actually updated it recently based on uh, a number of great questions that came through uh, recently. So I, I'm happy to share that with everybody. Um, and so I'm, I'm really happy to be here tonight. Uh, for this complex topic, because again, like uh, Kim and I were at an event last night where we got to hear uh, uh, the new CEO of Karen Foundation, uh, this guy John Driscoll, speak and talking about the the, the numbers and the complexity of um, uh, substance use disorder and how pervasive and how the numbers are really staggering. Um, and so, a number of the questions that that came in uh, for me. Uh, before tonight's talk were, uh, do you have up, updated statistics? Do you have updated numbers, real data? And we do uh, up to 23, 24. Um, and I will get into those numbers momentarily. Uh, but I do want to start by talking about another number first and just acknowledge 14 years for your son, Kim. That's an amazing thing. You know, and the personal journey of uh, being there with him is your own personal journey. And, you know, I celebrate your 14 years of your own personal journey of the recovery process, because not only does an individual get well and, and can get well from uh, mental health and substance use disorder, the family can get well. And what uh, Kim's impact has in the last 14 years in our Philadelphia region is just unremarkable. And I can't thank her enough. Every single day, for those people who don't know, I, I, yeah, I sit on the board of be part of, or no, I, I'm, I'm an advisor to be part of the conversation. I forget the technical term, sorry. So, but every day, regardless of my affiliation or connection with be a part of the conversation, I send out links to be a part of the conversation website. It's free, it's accessible, the YouTube links, the education. I mean, it is like none other out there on the internet. So just know if you're a family or an individual looking for answers or questions, or, or want reminders of, of any of these topics that we're going to talk about tonight, know that you can always go back to, uh, and Kim put it in the post, go back to the website and know that there's YouTube videos. And yes, four years ago this week, talk about another statistic number, we literally just turned the page and flipped and turned everything to telehealth, right? And everybody said, okay, we're going to do this and here we go. And, 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 for some parts, there's silver linings that I could talk about telehealth and how we were able to, to connect and telehealth prevention. And I, and again, I see prevention is a part of treatment. And I can't stress that enough, that the, the onset of real dialogue, real statistics, real information, and, and your participation tonight on a beautiful night. You know, somebody was wondering about numbers coming out tonight. It's a nice night out, so a lot of people don't want to show because it's just a nice night. There's so many distractions. So I respect and thank everyone for coming out tonight. 
Um, and so when we get into this discussion around like what's happening, the updates around this, you know, these teens today and, and what's happening real time and, and what's been like, um, it, it, it's challenging. It, 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 no joke. I mean, th there's been... Uh, again, I now I'm lucky to supervise uh, a lot of uh, therapists and uh, as a part of ethos, uh, I'm going to speak as a clinician, as direct, I still have a caseload, uh, as a supervisor, as I supervise, I'm a clinical supervisor for all the ethos treatment. We have seven locations in telehealth and, and I supervise a lot of other therapists and talk to Philadelphia region and national providers. But I'm also going to speak in, in research today and I'm going to start just with CDC numbers and and those numbers, which I, I, I was talking with Kim right before, and I said, you know, I'm not a huge fan of um, what do you call it? It feels a little like scare tacticy, dare tacticy, meaning like I really never want to, um, I never want to uh, lead with like scary numbers, uh, but there's a lot of impacts and a lot of things happening. Um, in our schools, in our adolescents, in our middle schools, and, and the onset of the exposure to a lot of middle school use, uh, that's the other thing we're seeing already. Um, I used to do prevention talks for high schools mainly. I used to talk about technology, which I'll talk about tonight. And I remember it would be geared for seniors and junior parents. And then it was freshman parents in high school. And then it was middle school. And now it's fifth grade centers and that's what I'm talking about, the kids' exposure to technology. But then when we talk about substance use disorder, we're talking about the onset and the exposure of these chemicals, you know, at such an early age because of, you know, the rapid increase of, uh, of availability of these substances as well. Uh, if you want to get an education, uh, if you want to get an education beyond the classroom, I don't recommend bringing your child to do this, but go to a local Sunoco gas station and see what you can purchase at a gas station today, what you can purchase uh, and without much, you know, uh, checking IDs to find out what's available for kids today and, and what's available on this thing called the internet, which I'll talk a little bit about. So numbers, rapid increase of use of nicotine and vaping is, I, I thought in 2019, the fall of 2019, there was all these um, hospitalizations for popcorn lungs. And I was all excited, not that it was, it was happening, but I was like, oh, great. This is going to really impact the kids. The kids are going to stop vaping. And I was all excited and it's just taken off. It's not stopped. And yes, they're trying to get a little bit controlling on it. Meaning, you know, they're not direct advertising of adolescent flavors, but they're still out there. Uh, but the pervasiveness of vaping, meaning it's so accessible. I used to walk around with a vape. Now I don't even need to because it's literally smaller than my thumb it is what the size of these vape products are that they can literally access it so quickly in schools and around. And I'll talk a little bit about uh, how it jumps to, to cannabis. Um, since we were talking about the pandemic earlier, at the height of the pandemic, when everything was shut down in 2020 uh, and 2021, when all the stores were closed, when when all the bars, nightclubs, and classic places that you could purchase alcohol, alcohol sales went up 15% during the height of the pandemic, and they have not gone down. Year after year, they continue to rise. So the increased use of alcohol and, and the misuse of alcohol and the increase of cannabis, we can't even put a number on the increased use of cannabis just because literally the availability of the product, and, and just as it becomes more legal or decriminalized or just because it became medical marijuana so many families and so many kids miss uh read that as it's no big thing it's no problem and and i want to pause there for one second before i jump to some of the statistics and just say like when i see and talk to kids every day you know the parent behind them is saying well i smoked a little bit of pot in the 80s it is our biggest generational divide next to technology, which I'll talk about. You know, cannabis use in the 70s and 80s was like 4 to 5% THC content. And now in 2016, 2017, that before pandemic, uh, what they've gone up to is like 30% THC content in the plant. And that's a much different substance. And then when we get to vaping products or edibles, 
you know, when it comes to vaping, it's more like 90% THC content in the vape products, uh, in the cartridges, in the dab pens, and that's more like 90% THC content. And then when we talk about these edibles, I, the gentleman I, I was referring to last night had a really funny comment. How many people in here eat just a little piece of chocolate or stop at a tenth of the, the size of a gummy bear, right? No, no one. You know, when you eat candy, right, you would just eat a couple of handfuls, right? Well, gummy bears and edibles is, is based on such a small dosing that kids aren't paying attention to how much they're ingesting when it, when it comes to edibles. So when it comes to edibles that are candy, like uh, gummies that have THC infused in them and, and other edibles, kids aren't stopping with eating one. And then the other thing is they don't feel it at first. There's a delay impact. So though uh, every kid that I've ever treated that has gone in for hospitalization for psychosis, which is a real thing, they come out and they say, oh, I didn't feel anything, so I took another. And then I didn't feel anything, I took another. And then I see, no, they took a dosing of upwards of like 100 milligrams of cannabis, not knowing of what that really has a, as an impact. So when it comes to this product cannabis in our centers, when we assess for cannabis exposure, you know, it's a much different mechanism by vaping uh, edibles versus plant and how you ingest it. And so the mechanism, the vehicle of how you ingest it is, is, is a different product as well. Uh, and so that's the types of questions we have to really dive into when it comes to the exposure to the substance. Um, and then when it comes to, um, let me try this. Sorry, I wanted to go back to this. Thank you. Um, so the increase of uh, use of cannabis, I'll come back to the spike in overdoses uh, and fentanyl. And, and again, uh, we thought it was bad when 60,000 lives were lost in, in 2014 or 15. Uh, 2016 was 70, 2018 was 70, 2019. It's upwards of a, over 120,000 lives were lost due to fentanyl last year. Now, you have to think about this when it comes to the impact of this, what this has on our families, our communities, and the trauma that so many families and individuals have been directly impacted by an overdose. Uh, when I first started giving prevention talks in high schools and middle schools, I asked a simple question to freshmen, to seniors, to any class, and I would say this, and I would always start, and I still to this day always start a prevention talk with kids with this question. How many people in this here? How many people in this room know somebody that's been directly impacted by addiction? And almost every hand goes up. And then I ask, how many people in here know somebody in recovery? And luckily, year after year after year, that number of hands keeps going up, which is great, like Kim's son. But when it comes to the other question I ask now is, how many people in here know somebody that's passed away from uh, an overdose or direct impact from substance use disorder? Those hands are going up, and. The, the way that it affects the family, the way that the trauma that the family goes through or an individual loved one goes through is just like suicide. And our suicide numbers have gone up, our overdose has gone up, and that's the, the compound effect of the substance use disorder world. Um, so increased uh, diagnosis alone of, of substance use disorder, the definition has opened up where it used to be either you were dependent or you were abuser and now it's substance use disorder. So that diagnosis is capturing a little bit more lives. But the truth is the ones that we're really looking at, that number's gone up. It used to be, and I'm going to jump to the next slide, it used to be like 25 million individuals across the U.S. struggled with substance use disorder. Now that number in 2022 is 48 million. Uh, I double checked last night. We heard this guy give this talk. And I, I had to double check the number because I'm a guy that's like, it sounds like a lot. And he was right. And the number of folks that have diagnosed, been diagnosed age 12 or above uh, 48 million. And that number is pretty acute. And, and only more and more is actually going up. Uh, when it comes to uh, the substance use disorder, I'm going to jump back to later. Uh, but I wanted to get into uh, the next round is uh, a lot of people asked around the impact of mental health. And when we talk about mental health, I, I want to pause for a second. The mental health diagnosis, you know, 87% of young adults that have a substance use disorder have a secondary mental health issue. 
That's an old statistic that I still go back to from Treatment Research Institute at Penn. NIDA came out with research year after year after year, and they say National Institute of Drug and Alcohol, they say six out of 10 individuals, adults with a substance use disorder, have a secondary mental health issue. And NAMI, National Alliance of Mental Health, they came out with their own research. They said six out of 10 individuals with a mental health diagnosis have a substance use disorder. I think those numbers are low. I think when we talk about the complexity of substance use disorder and mental health, I think it's it's more like 90%, you know, with the but but it's it's not saying that this is something I really want to get across. These are individual diagnoses that we need to treat both and talk about both, but it's not like, well, once I solve my mental health issue, then I can go back to using. So it, I don't want to get that across. I want to be really clear and upfront. We have to treat both, we have to talk about both, we have to get to both, but both have their own individual kind of processes if that makes sense at all. So uh, when it comes to mental health, um, this is where I wanted to jump back to this statistics, rapid increase of depression and anxiety, increase feelings of isolation, spike in suicidal, and I'll get to those numbers, and again, increase mental health diagnosis. Somebody asked me once if, you know, the diagnoses are just going up because we're more aware of it. Yes, but I also think um, that people are talking about it more. People are getting to more therapy, so that's great. But I also think the impact of COVID and isolation and a couple other things really have affected the mental health across the U.S. Um, and so here's uh, some statistics when it comes to um, just trying to shorten that. 2022, one in four adults 18 and above have mental health diagnosis, 59 million, or 23%. And adolescents, 2022, 19% uh, have diagnosed or been directly impacted by major depressive disorder. One out of 20 adults 18 and above have thoughts of suicide the last year, 13% or 5.2%. And then the same thing with a plan. And... Um, one in eight adolescents, 12 to 13, had serious thoughts of suicide in the past year. Um, and one in 15 have made suicide plans. And one in 25 have attempted suicide this last year for adolescents. I agree with those numbers. I, I really do. And I see them and it's, it's a lot. Um, this study came out last year. It said 50% of young adults 18 to 24 reported anxiety, depression symptoms in 2023. So when you look at differential studies, it's one in four. Uh, it's it's the numbers are staggering when it comes to, and I, I'll send this all to Kim so she can have it for for uh, your follow up. Uh, but that's a pretty significant amount. So reasons, sorry, sorry, reasons for uh, increase uh, increased bullying at an earlier age. We saw a lot of schools talk about this in the last five years, even prior to COVID, but the increased bullying at earlier ages, uh, definitely the impact of isolation and disconnecting from peers during COVID. Um, and right before we were talking about um, the first couple years and the first year or two right after COVID, how there was this great expectation, Don used that term, this great expectation of kids going back to school, going back to normal. And there was almost this added pressure in the last two years that, oh, my gosh, things have got to get better. We got to get better here. And we're, we're back to normal. So everything's back to normal. And it's it's not. And so many of our youth had a huge adjustment disorder, a huge adjustment reaction to like going from two years and developmental years and now struggling. So what we're seeing are seniors and juniors in high school that were middle school age kids during COVID four years ago that lost those years of developmental peers, seventh and eighth grade to learn some of those skills and freshman year too. So now they're seniors and they're going off to college and they're crumbling, they're crumbling. Um, the one statistic I didn't put up there uh, back in October of 2024, I'm sorry, 2023. No, wait, yeah, 2023. Um, they came out this past fall at a couple schools by talking about uh, and then I looked up this national number of school absenteeism and school refusal is up 14% nationally. 
And when I talk to all local schools, uh, and, and, and Hatboro being one of them, uh, school refusal is up. And what does that mean? That means kids that would normally get services in school, that would get connected to counseling or have an SAP like Dawn to help coordinate care to get to treatment centers. They're not even getting to school. So they're, you're, you're, they're kind of parents are trying their best to help the kid, but in actually they're kind of enabling and maybe just taking it to a kid to a doctor and just getting a diagnosis just to help the kid not be truant. But that's not really helping the situation without a plan, without an action plan, and without support and, and community support. I'm going to talk about that in a little bit. Um, so when it comes to some of the other issues related to is isolation from peers, gun violence, fear of gun violence as well, uh, and barriers to getting to help beyond the marijuana epidemic and marijuana is information is the opiate epidemic. And I talked about the exposure to um, overdoses as well with adolescents. So before I jump to one of my next main areas of, of talk is the impact of technology on adolescents. I do want to avoid a, a key critical term called fuddy-duddyism. So when I get into this part, next part of the talk, I want to make sure everybody's clear with that term. Uh, back when I was a kid growing up, my parents were afraid of that rock and roll music was going to make me do drugs and alcohol. Uh, and when I get into the discussion around technology, technology is not going to make your kids to do drugs and alcohol. Um, but there's so many elements of social media that are already here, that are already taken off, that are already part of our society and, and really took off during the pandemic without much uh, parent oversight. And this is where it's kind of the biggest generational gap I've seen in my life and my work is the impact of technology. But when talking about it and when speaking to your kids, I want you to avoid dramatically the use of all or nothing statements and fuddy duddyism and blaming it on technology. Because again, in their world, their technology, um, um, we're immigrants, they're natives. So I was raised in an age uh, where we didn't have a computer even till I was like in college, right? They're raised with this in their back pocket uh, before they're whatever, you know what I mean? They're like, that's what they're used to. That's what they're seeing. I mean, the amount of kids I've seen live action on iPads is, is just, so they're digital natives. We're digital immigrants to this world. Uh, but here are some of the ideas of why technology can be really challenging is the language, the terms that are used, the bullying, the foul language, body image, even in males and technology around uh, exposure to pornography. The gaming violence is huge. Expo uh, how many kids do you know are watching a movie on Netflix, texting their friends, watching social media and, and on their laptops doing schoolwork? You know, they can't multitask. Multitasking isn't a real thing. And, and lack of developmental conversational pieces, meaning a fragmented language leads to, and fragmented communication leads to a fragmented relationship. And those are lacking that in-depth conversations. Um, correlation between mental health and, 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 and technology, the shaming, uh, blaming, derogative statements on a public level, abandonment on a public level, re-traumatization. Um, this is a big one where Again, I always share from my personal experience, when I had a bad day in school, I would have to take the bus home. I would get home to a house where there was one landline and my sisters all shared the one landline and we would go in the closet and talk to our friends and then go out and play. And the best news about school is the next day, there was a whole new drama, a whole new issue, a whole new thing versus in today's world in second period, somebody posted a picture of what happened. Somebody reposted that same picture. Or somebody's in a text thread about it today. So the re-traumatization of an event doesn't go away in a kid's mind. There's still live action, still feeling it. And the worst is that kids are feeling and seeing these things ongoing and revisiting it and seeing it. You know, when breakups happen or relationships end or friendships end, you know, so many kids, uh, when they talk about anxiety, uh, I'll define anxiety with the, the latest term of anxiety I see more prevalent than anything else is FOMO. For those people that don't know what FOMO means, fear of missing out. You know, with adolescents, kids try to keep up with everything. They try to track down everything. They try to sense what's going on in their community. But again, like kids are 
sometimes mean or kids sometimes don't think. And sometimes kids or even the best meaningful kids will post things without thinking about the impact of how people may take things out of context. And so when it comes to technology and when it comes to the impacts of technology, so many of our youth have that sense of FOMO where they fear that they're missing out of what's happening. Um, and the potential of obsessive relationships, principles of exaggeration, I've talked about FOMO, um, and, and potential for uh, importance of status updates and, and the likes. Um, because again, like, I don't know if you know this, but like, this is the other thing we're up against with technology is, did you ever hear about that party that you missed, you know, when you were, you know, when I was first working on substance abuse in adolescence, Fridays were a big day, but Mondays going back to school, kids would have to hear about that myth of a party on a Friday or a Saturday that they missed and they felt left out. So we used to be up against the myth of the party from last weekend. But now we're up against that image, that perfect image of that social situation that, again, if you have you ever attended an adolescent party? Have you ever walked past an adolescent crew? Have you ever had kids that come over your house and they're all on the basement on their phones? And the amount of times I've heard this from multiple kids um, that one of my favorite stories came from a local high school that I got a chance, I get a chance to talk to seniors and the senior group was telling me the story where they were hanging out and this kid, you know, at a high school party, they're all sitting around the couches. They're all looking at their phones. What, you know, what else do kids do at a party? They sit around on a couch, watch their phone. And the kid was scrolling, scrolling through social media. And then I see, you know, he was having FOMO and he looked down and he's like, wow, this looks like a really fun time. And he looked up and he's like, wait, there's Sally, there, there, there's Johnny, there's Sa And he realized you know, half the crew got up at one point during the party, went to the other room, took a bunch of photos, came back down and sat down. He was having FOMO for a party he was at. Do you follow? He was literally at an event where everybody was like up one five, five minutes, took a bunch of photos, came back down and sat down. And he was like, oh, man, I wish I was. there. Oh, I am there. You know, and so many kids don't talk about that idea, the principal exaggeration. I don't know if you know this, but let me just give you a big secret. Kids exaggerate. I don't know if you know this. Adolescents lie. I'm really sorry if this is the first time you're hearing this about your children or adolescents in general. They may make stuff up because they want to feel cool. And I'm very sorry this does happen. And this device is just another vehicle for that when it comes to that perfect image, that perfect view and the amount of apps that can make your face clear up like my adolescence of my, you know, face and how it looks today. So I hate looking at myself. So I'm going to go back to sharing a screen. Okay. So uh, what, thanks, Heather, for laughing at me. I appreciate the humor. Okay, good. So uh, FOMO, fear of missing out, uh, importance of status. Like I think I killed this idea. Correlation to mental health for substance use disorder. Um, this is what we saw in the early days, the accessibility and the affordability, uh, but we still see it in, in um, very anonymous uh, websites that kids will track down how to. And, and a lot of people think it's this like this dark web or black web. It's not. It's literally kids just search and seek, you know, answers that they want to find. And, and they want to say like, oh, well, this this one website told me that cannabis isn't that bad, or since this state said this, that it's okay. And the amount of times I have to combat information that are random pulls from the internet with truth, you know, or, or ethics or ethical research is every day, you know? So, but when it comes to the accessibility of it, uh, it is a way to kind of for kids to, to definitely get vape products. That's one of the things we saw throughout the pandemic until this day. Uh, but they're also to understand the affordability of things. I don't know if you know this, but this brings up two parts to a topic. It's it's really, uh, I could spend hours on this topic, but I'll just explain this in 30 seconds. The term recreational drug use when we were kids and adolescents was a term that, you know, kids might experiment, kids might try drugs. That's not as prevalent because of fentanyl, because of xylosine in the, in the city of Philadelphia, East Coast, and, and across the U.S. now. But... So many kids are getting smarter, so they want to get pills that they feel are safe. So they go to get prescriptions from medications. And I don't know if you're aware of this, but across the U.S., you can't find Adderall. 
in a CVS or Rite Aid. And why do you think that is? Because kids associate that as a stimulant and they try to get that as a drug, as a safe drug. But if you talk to, I have a client that has ADHD that really is prescribed uh, Adderall for their ADHD. She can't find Adderall as a prescription today because so many youth are trying to get it and trying to get it in an unhealthy way by wrong prescriptions. Uh, so when it comes to this complexity, does that make sense to people? Like that's what I'm talking about when it comes to the impact of the internet, they're able to pull this information, find it, share it. So they'll figure out how to get it. Um, these statistics are around kids uh, and teen time exposure. 67% uh, of teens observe negatively impact by the mobile device. 90% of teachers say that kids are emotionally challenged and increased use of it. The teenagers who spend five hours a day or more on electronic devices are 71% to have more suicide risk than factors of one, one hour use. One of the questions that was asked around, is there any research on average amount of time or best practice around amount of time? You could see, you could check, there is an app for like a weekly update on, on how much time you spend on your device. I would have that conversation with your kid. I would sit down and I prep and I coach parents every day to look at that and to sit with your kid and see how many hours they're on, on this app or that app and to really have a dialogue. You know, some of my adolescents are on their devices five, seven hours a day without blinking and they sleep for eight hours. They're in school for eight hours and then they're on their device for seven, eight hours a day. That's literally every waking moment. Now, are schools, they're not supposed to be on their device while they're in school? Are they on it in between class and all over the cafeteria? Absolutely. And I don't put it on schools. Like, we're just overwhelmed. So when it comes to this device, you know, I'll tell a kid, you know, what would you do if you had 15 extra hours a week? That's what I'm talking about. You know, when it comes to adolescent development, what would you do with 15 hours a week? How would you conduct yourself with 20 hours a week? If you had a part-time job 20 hours a week, what would you get? 15, 20 bucks an hour. That could be a that could be a car. Do you and, and, I'll, and I'll literally spell out a kid for a car payment and an insurance bill. And I'll say, look, if you worked a job 20 hours a week, you'd get a car. But 40, 60 hours a week on this device, what do you get from it? And and what are you getting from it? And that's something I'll talk a little bit more about with the self-esteem and self-worth. Um, when it comes to teens spend five hours a day, electronic devices are 51% more likely to get under seven hours of sleep. It affects sleep all the time. Eighth graders who rarely use are 27% more high likely for depression. 89% of parents blame themselves and their, for their responsibility of their child use. So don't blame yourself because this, again, this device took off in our world. You can renegotiate your relationship with technology you can help your children renegotiate a relationship with technology at any time. Um, the other big thing around technology that I tell with parents and adults every day is, again, I'm not anti-technology, but I want to start to set some parameters and some expectations around this thing called technology. So when it comes to you know the time of day, that's the thing I, I ask kids and parents and families to think about every day is what's the first thing you do before you get out of bed? What's the last thing you do before you go to sleep? And a lot of my clients will honestly say they'll be on social media before they fall asleep. And I'll be like, are you on it longer than you expected? And nine times out of 10, they'll say yes. And I'll say, so you wake up and you have an alarm clock. So instead of hitting snooze, what do you do? You start scrolling the internet. You start scrolling social media. And what does that do to your psyche? You know, and so are you embracing the day, engaging the day with technology and social media? Are you ending the day with FOMO? And is that a great way to kind of start and begin the day? And then I explain to families and individuals, your brains are most susceptible to struggles because if you think about it, you're almost in lucid sleep when you're about to fall asleep or you're just waking up. And I don't know about you, but I don't, I'm not functioning at where when I wake up. And that's when our brains are most susceptible to mindless scrolling, mindless activity. 
And again, if we're ingesting this, all I'm asking people to do is to think about like this, like any part of our world, what we're ingesting as this is a product, what we're investing as a product. And is, is the outcome of this product giving us what we want? Is, is, are we getting what we want from this product? And again, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 o'clock at night. So when parents ask me, what parameters do I talk about with, with kids and technology? I'll literally say, you know, at the end of the day, at the beginning of the day, that's when I want you to sleep and not necessarily, um, I want to read the question, um, not um, get in their heads about the substance or the technology. I would like to ask why there has been a new precedence of teachers giving 12 a.m. and 12 a.m. on Saturday nights. Isn't this contributing to anxiety? How would they feel if adults, we finally leave working and go for the weekend? So that's a homework. cool question around homework. Um, and that I don't necessarily want to put the school on spot. Uh, but I definitely, uh, I'll say this, I've seen this as a trend where kids will get homework assignments on a weekend. And I agree that they want to get to a weekend and have fun. We're planning a little bit, but I don't, I don't know the school policy. And that's a school question that I don't, I'll save toward the end. How's that sound? If Dawn wants to end, so at the end. Um, I apologize. I don't know that policy. So, um, the next part about technology, I've talked enough about this, and I just want to slide through a couple of these. Misinformation highway, multiple avenues of influence, dissemination of information, setup for impulsivity, driving and texting. So the setup for impulsivity, there at least once a day, I'll have a client text me, text me, text me, or call me, call me, call me. And I'm like, hey, I'm a therapist, or I'm in a session, or I'm, I'm, I don't, I don't have this even on vibrate when I'm in a therapy session because I don't want it to interrupt the flow of the presence of the, of the of the client experience. So when it comes to um, so many of our folks and, and individuals think they want that immediate fix, that immediate answer, that immediate resolve versus when we talk about resiliency at the end, we're going to talk about building an ability to kind of sit in an uncomfortability or sit with not knowing an answer or sit with Okay, I don't know that, but I'm going to move on this information and I'll come back to that. Like knowing how to pivot and 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 so many of our kids stop and say, well, I'm not going to move until I know this answer. Uh, and that's a big deal. Um, texting and driving is a huge deal. <laughs> Loss of nonverbal cues and, and some research all the way dating back to the UCLA study, 90%, 87% of communications nonverbal. The tonality of how I'm saying something, you know, when I'm looking at you and you're looking back at the screen, I, I was able to laugh earlier when Heather laughed, which I appreciate it, by the way. But it, it's like when I'm able to see people paying attention, I, I love in-person presentations. I'd rather do in-person presentations. I can read the room. I can open up. I can ask for an, an input. But the truth is, when it comes to technology in our adolescence, they send a text message. They don't see the response. There's a disconnect. And so many of our parents think, oh, I have a relationship. I text my kid all, all the time. When we don't really hear their sincerity or hear their tonality or their kid, your kid may misread or misinterpret, you know, hey, how are you doing? Just wanted to check in versus my parents are so annoying. They want to check in. And it's like, you just want to check in and see what's going on. And so many of our youth feel that as like, what's going on? And you're like, I just want to know what's going on. What's your plan for tonight? And, and again, the tonality and, and certain families I've had to do communication dialogues with around what version of communication are we talking about? Meaning uh, what style, what works and going old school and picking up the phone and calling and saying to a kid, this is our device. I'm giving you this device. This is going to be your device while you have it. And you keep it when you answer the phone and when I call you. And if you don't answer the phone, you don't get it. And so there's there's parameters. And again, you can renegotiate your relationship with your kids and technology at any, any time. Um, so is this your family dinner? Is this how you guys conduct yourselves? As much as I appreciate teachers, parents, you're a thousand school teachers. 
how do you conduct yourself around technology, how you conduct yourself around substance abuse, how you conduct yourself. So kids, watch what you do. And is this what our modern family really looks like today? And is this, you know, the, the toughest one I, I, I love is when the, the dad's looking at the screen and the kid's looking out the, and missing those moments, you know what I mean? Because I don't know how many moments we'll have uh, when it comes to these, these interactive moments and these moments of abilities to be present. Uh, and so as a result of, of the pandemic, as a result of so much, a lot of us are in places of burnout. A lot of us are overwhelmed. A lot of us are struggling with uh, the overwhelmingness of technology. So we as an individual need to look at our own relationship with technology a lot of times and start our own perspective of like when and how we are going to conduct our relationship with it as well. Um, when it comes to um, uh, before I jump to kind of solutions or pivot to kind of resiliency pieces, I wanted to ask, was there any other questions around like uh, updates on, on what we're seeing as, as treatment providers or national statistics, or was this in line with what you were expected to hear tonight? I just wanted to open up, and if you want to put it in the chat, I can anonymously ask um, that. Or any comments, feel free. I just want to take a second. Actually, I want to take a sip of water. So please don't mind me if I take a second. All right. If you guys don't have any questions, I'll keep going. And I have a lot of other stuff to get to. And I appreciate your question so far. And I appreciate your question so far and your input so far. Um, and so when it comes to uh, where we are, let me just do this real quick because I knew this was not. Thanks. Um, a lot of us are in compassion fatigue as well. Um, and when I said, and I left this as a compassion fatigue piece, I think some of our families and, and some of our parents um, are just so worried about our kids and our youth. Um, I hear that every day and I see that every day. And, and so when I tell families of kids with substance use disorder or I tell families with kids and children or young adults with mental health issues, I tell parents every day that this is a marathon. This is not a hundred yard dash. You know, this is not an overnight process. And this is going to take some time and energy for, through a lifespan of adjusting to look at a, a micro changes to get at a healthier relationship with yourself and your loved one. And so the word pivot comes to mind. And I love pivot because it means really to change the strategy without changing the vision. So I'm not asking you to change your value structure. I'm just changing, asking you to change how you approach things, how you set approach to resiliency. And we get into terms like resiliency and we're going to get into terms like advocacy and self-advocacy and how to teach that with our adolescents and our youth uh, to prevent the, the devastation of substance use disorder and to prevent mental health acuity you know, it's still going to happen. There's still going to be substance use disorder. There's still going to be mental health issues, but maybe we can shorten its duration or maybe we can increase the availability of support and network and knowing that families get well or educating yourselves in that family process as well. Uh, real quick, uh, real quick uh, uh, plug, that parent education program through Be a Part of the Conversation, it's a three-part program. I help sit uh, on that development team to, to kind of put it together. I am proud, so proud of not just, you know, the stuff that myself and this guy, Pat Dowling, contributed, but the families that contributed, the, the overwhelming family input, the real life experience of parent support was, was amazing. Uh, so you have to know um, that when, you know, dealing with families and dealing with parents, if you're a loved one and you're struggling, please know that parent, uh, the family uh, recovery course is such an amazing resource uh, and any of the parent support groups online. So when it comes to now what, I'll start with looking at technology and then I'm going to bridge into other kind of uh, just resiliency pieces with adolescents. Um, so first off and paramount, reclaiming your own relationship with technology you know, so many parents ask me, how do I get, my, how do I help my youth, my kids get off their device? 
I'll say, well, when do you get off your device? You know, and starting that conversation, no joke, by saying kids watch what you do. So let's evaluate our own relationship. Let's look at our own skills. Let's look at how we, you know, have kind of fallen into self-regulating ourselves by looking at this device as opposed to looking at others. And so another thing is educating on how complex these products really are. Um, and so these products, you know, what we're up against isn't just uh, some image, isn't just some video game, isn't just we're up against an algorithm, a well thought out algorithm. And I want to kind of talk a little bit about that for 30 seconds. Everybody remember the dawn of this thing called YouTube 2006, 2007. It was an amazing thing, right? Great, great product that really was flat for a couple of years. Um, and um, there's this great podcast called The Rabbit Hole that New York Times put out uh, called The Rabbit Hole. That's about um, this algorithm that these people put together. Uh, this nice gentleman put together. So if you like this cat video, then you might be suggested to like this cat video. And everybody thought that was so nice. And so it came from that kind of place of like, let's get viewership raised. And and if you like this, then you'll like that. And the next thing you know, the the viewership, the, the retention rates of somebody watching YouTube went up so dramatically. It's unreal how fast uh, viewership went up. So then they took that algorithm uh, to use in Facebook, Instagram, and, and the reels. And all those reels are based on your likes or dislikes or how long you watch a video for. And now the technology is down to a science of when you're looking at it, how you, how long you're looking at it. And, and so this algorithm has gotten so good. And that's where everybody's worried about TikTok. And you probably heard it's all over the news. Because again, the, the impact of TikTok in our society from a mental health perspective a for you page, uh, if you want to see what your kids are seeing, just ask them, hey, listen, I just want to see what you're getting exposed to. Because uh, the again, the New York Times did this amazing research of this false profiles that they put up. And they were so diverse. They're so unique. They're so curated. So kids just think that's their world. And it's, again, fragmenting parts of our world. That's the challenge. Um, so when it came to um, what would you do with a child who has good communication skills, but is, is living among their peers who don't? Uh, there's a lot of anxiety about others who don't respond in an uh, expected way. I promise I'll answer that question when I come to resiliency, because that's a better time for me to answer that. So I promise I, I, I will pull that up momentarily. So short version, hang in there. Um, when it comes to, I'm sorry, I hit this wrong. <laughs> I'm the tech guy that has tech issues sometimes. Um, I do tech talk and I can't even keep my PowerPoint open. Okay, here it goes. Uh, raising the conscientious consumption of technology was a fancy term for basically this. Again, I'm not a prohibitionist. I'm not going to tell people to never use drugs and alcohol. Sure, would I like you to not use drugs and alcohol? Absolutely. And there's the great research coming out around even just low exposure of alcohol is not great or low exposure to cannabis isn't great, especially in adolescents. And when it comes to technology, again, it's here, it's in our community, the kids need to use it. But I just want to raise the consciousness of it, the, the awareness of what we're consuming, what they're getting exposed to. That's the dialogue. That's the conversation. That's what you want to start with. So interventions for families, communication, communication, communication. And I'm going to get into what I mean by that a little bit later. Listening to your clients, listening to your families about their relationship with technology and evaluating their friends online, their exposure risk. And again, that's what I was saying. Watch their TikTok page. Watch their For You pages on Instagram. See what they're kind of typically looking at on a regular routine basis. Invite them to have a dialogue around it. Uh, educating around the improvements of uh, emotional regulation skills and learning about the new app or new game or new communication style. And I've been doing this talk for so long, so many apps have come and gone. And so I don't want you to get fixated on the one app because so many apps have come and gone. But to really fixate on the conversation is more about how they're approaching that product, how they're consuming that product and what's the latest app, if that makes any sense at all. We need a plan. We need a management plan. We need to create a 
family culture around screen time. We need to provide a contract or renegotiating contract at any time. And again, like so many of our youth don't are not aware of their digital footprint, their digital dignity. And what is that? What, what do I mean for digital dignity? Their goals for how do they want to be presented in our future? Some schools will give you scare tactics around, you know, the fact that um, admissions offices will look at your your um, your kids' social media. I'll let you in on a big secret. They don't. They don't have time. Admissions offices won't look at um, social media pages. Who will are other parents. And so meaning your child will get into a great college, and that's awesome, and your child will then get paired up with another child to live in dorm life with another child. That other parent is going to check out your kid's social media and your their, their digital footprint. And then that parent is going to call the school and say, I don't want my Johnny, my Sally living with that person because they posted some picture. That's what every college to this day for the last 15, 10, 15 years have been getting calls in student life and student resident calls have gone up dramatically because of that call. And another big thing are coaches. Uh, coaches look at digital dignity, digital footprint, NCAA uh, uh, jobs. You know, I, I employ uh, 47 folks. Uh, I don't personally do it, but um, our new company that we just coordinated with, they will do a deep digital dive on somebody's exposure and what they represent and how they are. Again, what people do in their personal life is one thing, but now that it's represented and it's now connected. So we have to be conscious of what we're presenting out there in our communities. So that's a big deal. So digital footprint, digital time and creating culture time, uh, creating technology free time. When I first started giving this talk, I used to give this present presentation where I talk about Tuesday and Thursday nights were technology free nights. And, and uh, some parts of my marriage, we go back to that. But the truth is my wife runs a telehealth company. And so she is on her device all the time. We're on our devices all the time. But the truth is we still need to have digital time without it. And I can't look forward to uh, going skiing in a couple of weeks because literally I can't be on my device. I, and, and again, we need downtime. We need to walk away from the product, going for a hike, I can't recommend enough, and I'll talk a little bit more specific as we get into it, but a digital free time as a family, a digital free night as a family, and that's what I'm talking about, creating family culture for screen time and non-screen time. So guidelines for communication, when you talk to your kids about this, this is an always big topic of, of importance about guidelines for communication, when and where. So many of our families go, oh, it's great. You know, I'm I'm driving Johnny to wherever, soccer practice, or I'm driving Johnny to or Sally to somewhere. The truth is a kid will feel trapped in that vehicle and they may not feel like it's a great time to talk. And you're going, you got 50 things on your mind, but great, I'm in a car. But wait a second, you might be stressed about running later. You might be stressed about traffic or you might be stressed. So it may not be the best time for you. Other kids, other families, sometimes having that screen of, of the, I'm sorry, the screen, the, um, the, the windshield sometimes is a nice distraction to talk about difficult things, elbow to elbow. But the truth is when and where you talk to kids is such a vital question to ask yourself. Like where? Uh, sometimes it's more invitational. Sometimes it's more uh, looking at, a setting that's neutral, a place that they feel comforted that they can come and talk to you. So it's not um, you walking into their world, their 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 setting, their safe place, but in, in, invite them to a safe, uh, mutually exclusive place or time. Um, does your organization provide individual guidance for families uh, to recreate their digital culture? Yes, uh, but uh, we can also send you some more information around that and I can get into more digital culture pieces. Uh, so that was another question that came up, which was great. Um, so when it comes to um, what I'm asking for guidelines for communication and, and talking through this, the idea of uh, when and where is such a vital thing about when and where you have that conversation with your kids. Um, it's really important to think about 
if they're exhausted, if you're exhausted and, and really trying to be intentional with your time and energy so you don't kind of get pulled into a direction. Um, and again, I know and I respect our lives. We have a lot going on, but trying to find those times and knowing that it may not need to be resolved on a Tuesday night at 10 o'clock at night, but maybe this can wait till Saturday afternoon and maybe I can have this conversation then. Um, listening and asking questions is a huge part of communication. I tell people every day the Columbo style of communication, uh, you know, that show Columbo where you, the guy would just scratch his head and ask a lot of questions, but he he knew the answer, but he, he would ask the question to incite the conversation. Um, that I can't tell you enough because you'd rather have the kids talk and you listen more. Um, I worked with a family once where we did a diagram on a board live action. And I said, okay, everybody's going to write down on a piece of paper and then I'm going to pair it and, and put it together. And I had everybody anonymously write down on, on a pie chart of how much communication do they talk versus their parent or how much the parent talks versus the kid talks. And of course the parent thinks they're only talking like 20% of the time, the kid is talking 80% of the time. And the kid was thinking the parents were talking 80% of the time and the kid was only talking 5% of the time. And so what I, what I stress is, and then I talk about the difficult topics. Here's the other tricky when I talk about difficult topics, like how much of a percentage are you talking about difficult topics versus how much are you talking fun, relaxing, downtime, um, explore, explore, fun time. And if you're just talking about really difficult topics or you're just having those really difficult time topics, then the kid feels that, oh man, here we go. Here's a serious conversation coming and they tune out, they tune off and they're not open uh, to what you're talking about. And that's that's what I'm talking about around that pie chart. So listening is such a critical thing. Uh, detach from the debating society, meaning try not to get in a power play with your kids. Try not to get caught up in that's completely wrong. Or even if they're saying something that may be wrong, um, my favorite intervention for kids every day is like, huh, that's enough of a sentence. You don't have to Reply to everything. You don't have to get into everything. You can say, huh, that's interesting. Or that's a really interesting way to view things. Or um, that's a nice way to say that. Or I'm surprised you would think that. Or I, I see things a little bit differently than you, but I'd be open to a discussion. Would you? Uh, is, is a better, more beautiful way than saying, you are, what are you thinking? And then it just gets the kid defensive, gets your blood pressure going, and then, you know, that's where it gets really important. Um, I'm going to talk about these next two things uh, over the next couple of slides, but I'll start by saying small conversations. This gets back to this idea of a marathon pace. So many of our families and parents, when they get to communication, when it comes to these great conversations, they see a door open and they go, oh, I'm going to have, I'm going to have the drop down list of all the things I've been meaning to talk to Johnny or Sally about. So I'm going to push it all into this conversation. A kid gets overwhelmed, a kid shuts down, you know, and, and so when it comes to therapy, you know, individual sessions are about an hour, group are about two hours. We, we see that because kids and young adults and adults hit a saturation point. And, and so to know, like, we don't have to solve everything and, you know, 55 minutes flat with three commercial breaks and my name is not Dr. Phil. You know, we're not gonna be able to dramatically change someone's life and have commercial breaks. So know that smaller communication or looking for successful communication around one topic and be like, well, that was great. Okay, we're just gonna end on that note and say goodnight, thank you, You know, is, is a much better way to move forward in, in, in a communication leaning into a conversation as opposed to, great, we got to that topic. Let's get to these five other things and get everything in. And the next thing you know, a kid just shuts down or explodes. And then you lost that first point to begin with that was so successful. So that's a big thing. Uh, my, eight, my, my very favorite thing is called The Four Agreements. Uh, it's a wordy book. I, I used to recommend it every day. I still do kind of, but I put it out as a big um, caveat. Uh, that Don Miguel Ruiz is the, the the author, writes a chapter that could be written in a paragraph and a paragraph that could be a sentence and a sentence that could be a word. He's an amazing writer. He just goes deep. So if you're into that, go for it. Uh, so the four agreements are simply this. Uh, to speak with integrity, speak your word, speak your truth. 
And that idea is that you want to be honest, you want to be truthful, and you want to be thoughtful about how your word is so powerful that you don't want to come in a shaming, blaming way, but an inviting, clear way of clear communication and honest communication and not to feed into some unhealthy, negative communication. That's number one. Uh, number two is to not take things personally. Uh, that's a big one for families and, and parents and individuals. When they personalize and feel like the kid is having a bad day and then the next thing you know, the kid takes it out on you, you kind of know it, but you still react to that and you still want to. But here's the thing. Just because a kid's having a bad day doesn't let them be a whatever. You can still hold a boundary to the kid and have an expectation for the kid and everything else. But the truth is, you know, when it comes to these not taking things personally, you don't want to lose your footing and your solace of what you're trying to get across. Uh, to that end, I have a dog that's now gnawing at the door. So I'm going to take 30 seconds and open. This is the beautiful part about working from home. So you're going to hear a dog walk in the room. So um, instead of the dog pressing the dog door, you may have not heard it. I did. So the second one is to not take things personally. The third um, is to always do your best and your best will change on any given day. And this translates to being honest with yourself, being honest with your environment, and knowing that every day you're going to have the bandwidth to do it, and some days you're not, and that's okay. So that concept is that always do your best, and your best will change on any given day is really important. And to be clear that some days, like last week, I was sick, two weeks before, I had a lot going on, but I couldn't just depend upon and present like I was all that in a bag of shit. I, I just started my sessions and I started my meetings by saying, hey guys, I'm not at 100% today. And being honest about where I'm at is really important and watching my expectations of how much I could take on. Um, and the last one is I, I did it out of order. I apologize just because of the, I'll, I'll blame it on my dog for interrupting me, uh, is to not make assumptions, um, to not assume what's going on in someone else's world, to not make an assumption based on, you know, a kid will walk in and you'll read they had a bad day but you don't want to project why and be like, oh, I know why you're having a bad day because you did. And again, like you might be curious and find out why they think they're having a bad day and really ask questions and lean into the kid as opposed to, you know, come at things, if that makes any sense at all. Um, so when it comes to another big piece was talking about building resiliency, building resiliency is, is what these next uh number of things are to help kids uh, build the resilience they need to combat mental health issues, combat substance use disorder. And what is prevention uh, is really based on these principles around making connections, providing children a healthy environment where they can to have friends or clubs or ways to meet like-minded kids. Um, helping kids uh, help, help them to help others, you know, feeling good about volunteer work. The amount of times I tell individuals, I'll self-disclose all the time. The way I found out how to do what I wanted to do in my life, I volunteered. And that led me down the path to do what I do today. So the amount of what comes out of volunteer work is amazing. Um, daily routines. Uh, kids need daily routines like none other. And that consistency of daily routine is such a huge thing. Um, and I can't tell you enough why daily routines are so vital about sleep patterns. Even just this one hour off with uh, the the hour pushback or lo loss of an hour, I apologize. That threw off a lot of our folks. Um, taking a break, uh, literally walking away from the situation, taking a, a, a breath and, and coming up for air is such a huge thing. Uh, teaching your child self-care. What does that really mean by being an example of how to essentially take care of yourself so they can watch up to your own self-care? Move toward smaller, more manageable goals and sticking to them. Um, nurture a sense of positive self-view. Uh, positive um, psychology is a type of psychology I've done a lot of research in recently. Uh, it came from positive psychology out of uh, University of Pennsylvania. There's a lot of research on PERMA. Uh, which is positive, engagement, um, and and the the basics of it are around positive self view, um, because again, depression and anxiety really fixate on negative self view, 
um, and isolation is a, is a core of depression, mental health issues, and substance use disorder. So getting some perspective, because addiction or alcoholism and mental health issues rob someone of their perspective of reality. So, so many of our youth will fixate on negative self-worth, negative self-image. So to improve that self-image, to improve that ability to see what's going on, uh, like a gratitude list, a, a real simple way of looking at healthy, positive self-view, what strengths perspective means, uh, and, and a an out, healthy outlook, uh, looking for healthy opportunities for self-discovery and different ways to develop healthy opportunities, and accepting change as a part of our life. Children develop into thriving adults as long as we nurture them as they deserve. You know, nurturance of giving them a chance to see that P.S., you know, one of my biggest thing around accepting that that change is a part of living, ex acceptance that sometimes there's there's a challenge that happens. You know, one of my favorite interventions for parents, one of the hardest things I'm asking parents to do on this call is to not do something. Let me say that again. The most ca challenging, complex thing I'm asking parents to do is to not solve your kid's problem, to not jump in and fix everything, to not give a kid an answer, but to let a kid struggle and let a kid learn that they can figure something out. And I, I'm talking to my son's age, who's five, to uh, 25, to 35. Don't rob a kid of their ability to fix their own issue because that self-discovery, that self-awareness of like, and that self-esteem boost of like, I was able to do something. You know, I, I've been working with this kid who who just had a, my earlier session today was was a kid that needed to just, send a text message to a job and say that, hey, I'm sorry, I'm not going to be able to work there. And I've coached her on it. And, you know, the the light up in her eyes when she finally sent the text message in session, you know, she prepped it, she processed it with me. And it was a simple text message, but she felt so good about accomplishing and clarifying communication. And again, like her parent wanted to call and just tell the, the person, oh, they can't work anymore. I'm like, let's not rob this kid of this simple communication skill, and learning that that's a vital thing. Uh, the next thing actually comes from uh, one of our our therapists, um, uh, Gail uh, Duffy in, in Collegeville, uh, talks about using the seven C's. Uh, this Dr. Ginsburg is a child pediatric. Now, I like some of the language, and I don't love it, but she uses this uh, all the time in the seven C's for resiliency. Um, and so it, it's just a simple way to, to look at how to build resiliency in kids is competency, the ability to know that you can handle stressful situations or difficult situations effectively. And you wanna build that competency by experience and exposure to really difficult things. We call that exposure therapy with kids and exposing them to an ability uh, to you know look at um, I'm sorry, I went to look at the question, which is a great question, which I promise I'll answer in a second. Uh, but the, the ability to hold a difficult, stressful situation and learn how to build that, learn how to do that. Confidence, you know, how do you build self-esteem by esteem of relax? How do you build self-confidence by clear confidence acts? Children gain confidence by their ability to demonstrate competency in real life situations. The next one, the third one, is probably the most important thing. It's the answer to a lot of challenges when it comes to mental health and substance use disorders, connection. You know, and strengthening ties to be a good friend, caring for a family member, and being a part of community, connection, belonging, a sense of belonging, connection. You know, uh, that there, there's a drug, there's a natural drug that goes off in my eyes when I'm looking at the screen, and there's a couple of people on the screen, which I appreciate you looking it, it, it's the truth that there's a thing called oxytocin that goes off in my brain when I looked at my dog's eyes, when I look at my son's eyes. Oxytocin is a natural drug that goes off in our bodies and our brains that helps us feel relaxed when we see somebody. And that's where I think, you know, in-person counseling is probably my choice. In-person group counseling so we can see and feel and hear. Uh, but if not, we can do visual therapy like this a lot of times with telehealth. And the reason why I say that is because, again, being able to see people and feel people is such a huge connection. So connection is the cure a lot of times. And there's a great TED Talk on, you know, all we know about addiction is wrong. And the guy basically says that it's great uh, 
topic, a great title. But what he gets at is that connection is such a critical thing and, and having people feel a part of a community. And, and that's where recovery and, and mental health recovery is about that connection. Character build, enjoying a strong sense of self-worth, self-confidence. They touch in their values, their comfort level by sticking to them, their character, demonstrating their caring attitude toward other, a strong sense of what's right and wrong and a preparedness to make wise choices. And, and we talk about DBT, dialogue with behavior therapy, and, and the wise mind, the choice mind, the ability to think through and get beyond the emotional decision, but to think through it and have that wise mind. Uh, contribution, what are you bringing to the table? How are you bringing to the world? How can you show up to the world? How What can you contribute to a conversation even? Uh, and if you're contributing to, a, a, you know, I'll never forget the amount of, young adults and adults that I work with that are in recovery uh, that like three months, two months into their recovery, they get the key for the 12 step meeting and they have to show up and make the coffee. And all of a sudden they feel more a part of a community like that when they have to clean up the ashtrays is what they used to have to do, but they would have to put the chairs away or, you know, be a helper. And so uh, that's why residential long-term programs or in therapy, or we do a lot of times in programming, We'll give kids uh, jobs to do while they're in treatment to what they are contributing to a part of the household. So again, this gets to like, what are they doing in their own homes? So are they contributing? Are they doing things like chores and 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 putting away their clothes and that kind of stuff? Uh, one of the first residential programs I worked at, uh, they did research on what's called ADLs, active daily living, where they would go around the entire units and see if you made your bed, if you brush your teeth, if you again, these daily functioning things get overlooked sometimes. And, and again, self-worth, self-confidence goes up dramatically if they're actively engaged in that um, daily, active daily living, ADLs. Um, coping strategies, development of coping strategies, learning multiple and, and developing social skills, stress reduction techniques, uh, what do I really mean by that? I can do a whole lecture on just stress reduction techniques, but the idea is for kids to form ways that they feel uh, that they can learn emotional regulation skills. Um, one of the key topics um, that, that gets talked a lot about in all of our treatment centers is, you know, emotional regulation skills starts with emotional awareness, starts with really accurately talking about what's the real emotion going on. So many of our youth go to these extreme languages of like, I hate you, I, I, I wanna commit suicide, I wanna use drugs and alcohol. But what's underneath those feelings? What's underneath the anger? Anger is the most misdiagnosed feeling a lot of times. There's fear, there's anxiety, there's something else. So to accurately talk about what's really happening, what's the de what is the stressful moment going on? And to really kind of differentiate, there's a great podcast that 10% Happier Guy did. Uh, he interviewed a woman about uh, the difference between stress and anxiety. And so many of our families jump to a diagnosis of anxiety when they're stressed. They don't know how to manage stress. And I think that's an important differential too, to really talk about the language and how we talk about things so that we're really talking about the same thing. So coping mechanisms, the importance of developing coping mechanisms. And so that we're offering a sense of healthy, effective ways to prepare ourselves. Um, and control, when kids feel that they have a sense of control. Now, this is one of the big words I don't like. I don't like control. I'm, I'm sorry. I like advocacy. I like self-advocacy. And, and they can make decisions and actions. Uh, they they Then they're more likely... To, to, to follow through their decisions if they feel like this is their decision. When you give kids an opportunity to feel like they can do something and they've made the decision, and I'll tell a kid, hey, listen, do you want to go to wilderness? Do you want to go to a residential program? Or do you want to go to IOP? And they go, I want to go to IOP. I'm like, what do you think they really want to do? So, but you said it, you want to do it. So let's do this, you know, so let's really commit to what you say you're going to do versus you know, if you tell a kid he's got to, and you start a conversation with you have to, then that's not going to have a kid feel a part of that decision. But if you give kids some self-advocacy, some sense of control, so they can feel that they can make the decisions to move forward, I think that's another big one as well. Self-advocacy for teenagers. What is it? 
is speaking up for oneself and ability to know your rights, communicating your rights and their values. And, and they need it to make decisions and how to ask for help and when they need it is such a critical piece around self-advocacy. Um, I can go on and on and on. I, I do want to be mindful of our time. Um, and I do want to end a couple minutes around technology, but before I finish the last little bit on technology, any questions around, did that, the, the seven C's make sense to you? Um, I, I saw one chat that I wanted to respond to. Yes, kids have uh, lower frustration window tolerances nowadays. They rarely face opportunities to feel frustrated and do it. I find myself looking for small opportunities with my own child to experience small amounts of frustration. And that's what we want to build on. And to really kind of lean into those abilities to see, like, here's a little opportunity to grow. Here's a, here's an ability to to see, like, wait, you were able to successfully manage, you know. And I even tell people, think about this. Um, when you, when you're in, um, um, and this gets to that other cre recreating their digital culture, when you're in a line at Starbucks or in a line anywhere, or go to a doctor's office early or go to an event early, or would you ever go to an event at the school early? Everybody shows up, sits down quietly and jumps on their phone, you know, versus striking up a conversation versus saying, how are you doing? Versus saying, you know, just a simple interaction, eye contact, uh, a head nod. You know, it's, it's, I think, learning how to develop those interactive skills at any age and renegotiate and recapturing those reconnection ages or reconnection abilities. I think that's a huge thing to reconnect to our digital culture. So I did want to end on some of those notes when it comes to the individual is asking about technology. Um Creating technology, free time, therapeutic events don't need any technology. Live by example, I talked about enough. Um, the attachment theory, the importance of feeling emotionally supported is vital part of development. So that's, again, get back to uh, euphoria of, of uh, oxytocin and being able to look at somebody versus a screen. Uh, avoiding being fuddy duddyism when you talk about it. Uh, but listening to your kids about it and really kind of knowing that it's here and knowing that we have to pivot around it to really get at it uh, and reevaluating or adjusting our goals. So that means at some point in my career, I wanted kids to be off their devices for hours a day or to hand it in every night. But maybe maybe a kid needs to hand in their phone Monday through Thursday night or maybe Sunday through Thursday night, school nights that they have to hand in their device at 11 o'clock at night so that they get some sleep. Or maybe uh, we have to find times during the week where they need to be less around the screen time. And again, you can have a technology-free zone. You can have a technology-free night as a family. You can try to develop technology-free events, making them interactive, like going for a hike, going for a walk, going to a museum, doing something. And when you get to the event, be like, okay, everybody's going to leave their phones in the car when we go to... Longwood Gardens or go wherever so that you can just show them that we can be in the moment together. We don't need our devices to capture the moment and live in between. Um, so Kim, I wanted to be mindful of time and say that I'll, I'll reiterate again before I turn it back over to you um, that the, the survey monkey, we really want your feedback on future topics. Uh, any questions or other feedbacks? Uh, please know that, again, Kim's resources are amazing. Thank you for coming tonight. Thank you for uh, coming out tonight. I appreciate it. And again, congratulations on 14 years for your son, Kim. So how's that? I'll, I'll pause there and turn it back to you. <laughs> Thank you, Mike. That was great. And thanks for all the kind kind words. I really appreciate it. would love to hear from all of you. If you feel like raising your hand or shouting out a question, you can feel free to unmute and jump right in. <clears throat> Thank you so much, Mike. That was really comprehensive. I'll just reference, this is uh, Don Tucker Happy Worship. I'll just reference the question about assignments. And I would say that would be district and teacher discretion. Um, I think as school districts, we do sometimes get pushback from parents um, if we don't allow the full day for an assignment to be turned in. Like if we say by end of school day, on such and such a date, then it's like, well, you didn't, you said it was due this day, they should have enough time. So sometimes we get pushback. So I think it's, it's um, discretion and flexibility. So it could be awesome setting your own parameters if a child's not allowed to be on a device after a certain time, 
that would be, you know, how you handle within your home. Um, and I do think that that's some of the reality that's happened in the real world where it's like, we'll give you until 12 o'clock at night to, um, to complete that. So again, I think it would be different based on the district. I think it would also be different based on teachers. Some teachers are very strict about timelines and some are a little bit more flexible. Anybody have any questions or comments or experience you want to share? That's why I only left like five minutes at the end. Figure yeah. or asked some good questions, made some good comments, and then and again, I try to. I know it's such a complex topic that I try to get to a lot of different aspects of it, and we can go in a lot of different directions. But I appreciate uh, again the great questions before. I think I covered a lot of them. I think you did too. You know, I think that we hear so much um, about, you, this is something you talked about early, early on when you when it got into your technology talks, right? Is that the onset of technology is so much more rapid than any other kind of um, developmental, you know, what television, radio, all that kind of stuff. And, oh, here, let me, let's go to this person. If you had to cite a single ideological cause beneath the spike in teen suicidality, what would it be? Um, I would say that there's not one and that's the challenge. It's, it's a multi, it's a perfect storm of different events. And I think the impact tech technology is one event. I think the, the rise of stress is other events. And I think so many different intersecting pieces. So it's not just one and Dawn, your head's not in agreement. Would you want to share from a school provider at being in, in school settings as you've been? I would say that that it would be impossible to say that there is a single reason or, you know, justify reason, or um, I think it's just like said, a series of, of different events. And sometimes some, you know, some things that are happening in a child's life can, or anybody's life can really, you know, impact um, day to day. If they're getting treatment, not treatment, if they have resources, not resources, peers can be a big influence. So there's so many compounding factors um, that, you know, humans have to deal with. It's a great question. And I look for that all the time. But it's usually a lot of different factors, you know, and again, early onset of exposure to technology with kids, bullying or at an earlier age. And, and again, our youth are getting exposed to a lot more things younger and younger and younger. Mm -hmm. So that's that's the thing where it used to be older. And, and, and again, like the developmental cue is much more earlier in life, too. Great question. Yeah. And again, thank you for your feedback. So. What, yeah, that's kind of where I was going a little bit with this, too, is that, you know, we every generation thinks like, oh, this next generation is just like you talked about, Mike, like TV's, you know, rock and roll is going to ruin my kid and all that kind of stuff. I, I think it is pretty universally understood, though, that the challenges that adolescents are experiencing now are pretty unprecedented. Wouldn't you agree with that? Uh, so, yes, absolutely. And, and again, um, I think post pandemic, we had no idea. Uh, yeah. when it came to the pandemic and what we went through as a whole society. I was talking to Rick Shugart last week as therapist, local therapist, that this was the only thing that from our life experience that we as therapists were going through while our whole society was going through it as well. So again, it, it's it, there's so many different intersections of the isolation, disconnection, stress in our world that that I think it's just so many different things that have led to this, this difficult time. Right. And, but and kids you know, do get well, kids do get connected, kids do, and their families do get well as well. Right. And you know what a huge Anna Lemke fan I am. If if you all who are still with us haven't read the book Dopamine Nation, it's phenomenal. And I just think that her her the way she posits this whole thing about this dopamine rich culture that we live in. Yes. You know, all the sports betting and then the, you know, all this is what we were talking about tonight is right, is is looking at process addictions, frankly, you know, and how young people are so much more vulnerable because of being tech native, as you described. Um, but just instant gratification times a thousand, right? With everything so available. So it's it's a challenging time, but but thank you for the really great tools and great insights and solidarity <laughs> with everybody out there who's in education or parent parents and raising kids. Thank you. Thank you for everything that you're doing. Thank you guys so much. Thanks for your input. Really appreciate it. So. Thank you, Don. And thank you, Michael, so much. Really, really appreciate it. Yeah. Thanks, everybody. Thank you both to HHEF and, and be a part of the conversation. Mike, always a pleasure to have you here with us. Great. Everybody has a great night. Great.
Thanks again. Thanks, everybody.